operations on sets. The union of the sets A and B is the set of elements that are in A or B or both. Symbolically, we have A union B is equal to the set of X such that X is in A or X is in B. Here's a Venn diagram representing the union of A and B. You could see that we shade completely all of A and all of B, including the intersection. Speaking of intersection, the intersection of A and B is the set of elements that are simultaneously in A and B. So symbolically, we have A intersect B is equal to the set of X, such that X is in A and X is in B. Here's a Venn diagram representing the intersection of A and B. You can see we only shade the part that is common to both A and B. The difference or set difference A minus B is the set of elements that are in A and not in B. So symbolically, we have A minus B equals the set of X such that X is in A and X is not in B. Here's a Venn diagram representing the set theoretic difference A minus B. You can see we shade the portion of A that does not include B. The symmetric difference between A and B, written A delta B, is the set of elements that are in A or B, but not both. Symbolically, A delta B is the union of the two differences. It's A minus B union B minus A. Here's a Venn diagram representing the symmetric difference of A and B. Notice that we shade only the portions of A and B that do not include the other one. So we have shaded A minus B and we've shaded B minus A, but we left the intersection of A and B blank, unshaded. Let's look at an example. Let A be the set consisting of zero, one, two, three, and four, and B the set consisting of three, four, five, and six. Let's go ahead and perform the operations that we just defined on these two sets. Okay, so the union of A and B is the set consisting of 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. The intersection of A and B is the set consisting of 3 and 4. A minus B is the set consisting of 0, 1, and 2. B minus A is the set consisting of 5 and 6. And the symmetric difference of A and B is the union of the previous two differences, A minus B union B minus A. So it's the set consisting of zero, one, and two union with the set consisting of five and six, which is the set consisting of zero, one, two, five, and six. Here's a Venn diagram representing this problem. Notice that uh, zero, one, and two are in the part of A that does not include B, three and four, are in the intersection of A and B, and five and six are in the part of B that does not include A. Let's look at another example, this time involving intervals. Let A be the half open interval, negative two, one, not including negative two, but including one. And let B be the infinite open interval, zero infinity. And again, we'll perform the operations that we just learned on these two sets. When dealing with intervals, if you don't have a lot of experience, I find it helpful to draw graphs of each of the intervals, one over the other, like so. Here's, here's a graph of A. Notice it's the half open interval from negative two to one. So we draw an open parenthesis at negative two and a closed bracket at one, and we shade in between. And for B, we have the open interval from zero to infinity. So we put an open bracket at zero and we shade to the right of it going off to infinity. It's also a good idea to draw vertical lines at each endpoint of each interval. So notice I put vertical lines at negative two 
and one, because those are the endpoints of interval A. And I also put a vertical line at zero because that's the only endpoint of B. And now we could use these lines as guides to help us find the uh, sets that we're looking for. Okay, so A union B consists of everything starting at negative two, but not including negative two, onward to the right. So that's the infinite open interval negative two infinity. The intersection of A and B consists of the real numbers between zero and one. You can see how those vertical lines help us see that nice and easily. Um, notice that zero will not be included because it's open in B and one is included because it's included in both A and B. So it's the half open interval zero one, not including zero, but including one. A minus B can be found here between the first two vertical lines and that's the open interval uh, negative two to zero closed at zero. So uh, I should say a half open interval from negative two to zero, not including negative two, but including zero. Uh, B minus A can be found here uh, to the right of the last vertical line. And that's the infinite open interval one infinity. And the symmetric difference of A and B is just the combination of the previous two differences. So that's the union of those two, the union of the half open interval negative two zero and the infinite open interval one infinity. <clears throat> Unions and intersections have many nice algebraic properties such as commutativity. So for example, for the union, we have that the union of A and B is the same as the union of B and A. And uh, we also have commutativity for the intersection. So the intersection of A and B is also equal to the intersection of B and A. We have associativity. A union B union C is equal to A union B union C. And for the intersection, A intersect B intersect C is equal to A intersect B intersect C. We have distributivity. So the the union distributes over the intersection and the intersection distributes over the union. So uh, let's look at the intersection distributing over the union first. We have the intersection of A with B union C is equal to the union of A intersect B and A intersect C. And for the union distributing over the intersection, we have the union of A and B intersect C is equal to the intersection of the union of A and B and the union of A and C. Let's look at the associativity of the union in detail. We'll, we'll prove that this one is true. Okay, so theorem 6.2, if A, B and C are sets, then the union of A and B unioned with C is equal to the union of A with B union C. Let's look at Venn diagrams of this situation to help give evidence that this theorem is true. So here's a Venn diagram of A union B. Notice that we drew three sets, A, B, and C, because the theorem involves three sets. And I drew the most general picture possible, all three sets intersecting each other. Uh, to get A union B, we just shade both A and B. For B union C, we shade both B and C. And now coming from the left, if we take A union B and then union that with C, we proceed by shading in the rest of C. And if we look from the right, if we take B union C and then we take A union that, we proceed by shading in the rest of A. And you can see in both cases, you get the same picture all of A, B, and C are shaded either way. So this gives really good evidence that this theorem should be true. Before writing out the proof, I just want to recall one thing from basic logic. If a statement P is true, then for any other statement Q, P or Q is also true. We're going to use this fact many times in the proof of theorem 6.2. For example, if X and A is true, then we could say X and A or X and B is true. Um, the, the X and B is arbitrary. Anything after the or 
is going to be true simply because the first thing is true. So when, when you have an or statement, as long as you know one of them is true, you could put anything else and the statement itself will be true by the definition of or. Again, we're going to use this fact several times. Watch out for it as we go through the proof. Okay, proof of theorem 6.2. Let A, B, and C be sets. And we're going to start by showing that the left-hand side is a subset of the right-hand side. So we'll let X be in A union B, union C. By the definition of the union, that means that X is in A union B or X is in C. So we're going to do each of these cases separately. So first, let's assume that X is in C. Because if, if X is in C, then using the previous remark about the statement or, we could say that X is in B or X is in C. So by the definition of union, X is in B union C. Then again, using the previous remark about or, we could say X is in A or X is in B union C. And again, by the definition of union, X is in the union of A and B union C. Okay, so we did it for the case where X is in C. Now we have to look at what happens if X is in A union B. So if on the other hand, X is in A union B, then X is in A or X is in B. Again, we have to deal with two cases now. If X happens to be in A, then we could use the previous remark again to say that X is in A or X is in B union C. And by the definition of union, it, that means that X is in A union, B union, C. Finally, if X is in B, then again, by the previous remark, X is in B or X is in C. So X is in B union, C. And again, by the previous remark, X is in A or X is in B union, C. So by the definition of union, once again, X is in A union, B union, C. Okay, since X was arbitrary, we showed for all X, X in A union B union C implies that X is in A union B union C. Uh, therefore, in other words, we have shown that the uh, expression on the left, A union B union C, is a subset of the expression on the right, A union B union C. Okay. Now, a, a similar argument can be used to show the other direction, the other subset. I'm not going to go through all the details. You may want to write all those out yourself for practice, but it's very, very similar to what we just did. Okay, now since uh, the left-hand side is a subset of the right-hand side, and the right-hand side is a subset of the left-hand side, by the axiom of extensionality, we get that the two sets are equal, right? And therefore the operation of forming unions is an associative operation, as we were trying to prove. This theorem allows us to simply write A union B union C without any parentheses when taking the union of three sets A, B, and C. Uh, this is nice because it just makes it more readable, and uh, we can do this because it doesn't matter where you put the parentheses, you get the same answer, so we might as well drop them for easier readability. Now, we say that sets A and B are disjoint or mutually exclusive if the intersection of A and B is empty. Here's a Venn diagram illustrating two disjoint sets. Notice that they do not touch each other. So this is a Venn diagram of the intersection of A and B being empty. Let's look at an example. Um, the sets negative two, zero, this half open interval, and the set uh, one infinity, this infinite open interval, are an example of disjoint intervals, right? They don't have any elements in common. Let's now look at unions and intersections of more than two sets. Uh, just a quick warning, this last part of this section is challenging for most students the first time around. So this might be something you'll need to look at a few times and you may wanna come back to it when you're using unions or intersections of more than two sets uh, because it's not terribly difficult, but notationally it's a little tricky the first time around. So just a warning about that. Let X be a non-empty set of sets. We define union X to be the set of little y, such that there is big Y in X with little y and big Y. And intersection X to be the set of little y, such that for all big Y in X, little y is in big Y.
it will definitely be helpful to look at some examples here to try to understand these definitions a little better. So as a first example, let A and B be sets and let X be the set consisting of these two sets A and B. And let's see what union X is. So just copying down the definition of union X, the set of little y such that there is a big Y in X with little y in big Y. For this particular example where X is AB, this is the same thing as saying the set of Y such that Y is in A or Y is in B. And that's just the definition of the union of A and B, the usual union of two sets. Uh, similarly, the intersection X is the set of Y such that for all capital Y in X, little y is in capital Y, um, just copying the definition. For this example, it's the set of Y such that Y is in A and Y is in B, which is the intersection of A and B. So you could see that for two sets, these more general definitions of union and intersection agree with the simple definition of the union and intersection of two sets. What if we up it a little bit and we let X be a collection of three sets, A, B, and C? And in this case, union X is the set of Y such that Y is in A, Y is in B, or Y is in C, which is the union of these three sets, A union, B union, C. And similarly, in this case, intersection X is the set of Y such that Y is in A, Y is in B, and Y is in C, which is the intersection of A, B, and C. Uh, more generally, if X consists of N sets, say A1, A2 through AN, then union X is A1, union A2, union dot, 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 union AN. And intersection X is the intersection of these N sets, A1 intersect, A2 intersect, etc., through AN. Let's take a look at a very specific example of a union and intersection of finitely many sets, but more than two. We'll do four. Um, so we'll let X be the set consisting of these four sets, A1, A2, A3, A4. We'll make them intervals. So A1 is the uh, closed interval negative infinity five. It's an infinite closed interval. A2 is the open interval zero five. A3 is the half open interval two six. And A4 is the half open interval 499. Let's compute union X first. So union X is A1, union A2, union A3, union A4, which is the union of these four intervals. Um, now by associativity, we could just do two at a time and we could choose any two at a time that we want. Uh, let's just go from left to right. So taking the union of negative infinity five and zero five just gives us negative infinity five because zero five is a subset of negative infinity five. So we just get the uh, set on the left. Now we could take the union of negative infinity five with the half open interval two six to get negative infinity six. And finally, we take the union of negative infinity six with 499 to get the infinite closed interval negative infinity 99. Let's also take the intersection of these four intervals. Okay, so again, I'll just go from left to right. The intersection of negative infinity five and zero five is zero five. Again, because zero five is a subset of negative infinity five. And then the intersection of zero five with two six is the half open interval from two to five, including two, but not including five. And finally, when we take the intersection of this half open interval two five and the half open interval 499, we get the open interval from four to five. Let's do one more example. Let X be the set of half open intervals from zero to R, including zero, but not including R, where R is a positive real number. Okay, then union X, again, just rewriting the definition of union X. For this particular example, it's the set of Y such that there is a positive real number R with Y in the half open interval zero R. Let's show that that is equal to the infinite closed interval zero infinity. 
So I'm going to name the set Y such that there is a positive real number R with Y and zero R. I'm going to call that A just to make it easier to do the argument. And I'm going to show that A is equal to the infinite closed interval zero infinity. We'll show that each one is a subset of the other. So first let's show that A is a subset of zero infinity. Well, if Y is an A, then by definition of A, there is a positive real number R with Y and zero R. That means that y is between zero and r, possibly including zero. Uh, it could be equal to zero, but not including r. So it can't be equal to r, but it's somewhere between zero and r. In particular, just looking at the first part of that, zero less than or equal to y, that's equivalent to y greater than or equal to zero. But if y is greater than or equal to zero, it's in the infinite closed interval zero infinity. Okay, since y and a was arbitrary, we have shown that a is a subset of the interval zero infinity. Now going the other way, let y be in the infinite closed interval zero infinity. Okay, so since y plus one minus y is one, which is a positive number, we have that y plus one is greater than y. Okay, uh, which means that y is not just in zero infinity, but it's actually in zero y plus one. Okay, and since y plus one is a positive real number, y is in the set A by the definition of the set A. Okay, so since we picked an arbitrary uh, real number in zero infinity, we have shown that zero infinity is a subset of A. Okay, so we showed the subset in both directions. We showed that A is a subset of zero infinity and zero infinity is a subset of A by the axiom of extensionality. It follows that A is equal to the infinite closed interval zero infinity. Let's also find the intersection X. Okay, so again, just rewriting the definition for this particular example, it's the set of Y such that for all positive real numbers R, y is in the half open interval zero r and we'll show that this is equal to the set containing only zero okay so let's call this set b b is the set of y such that for all positive real numbers r y is in the half open interval zero r and we're going to show that b is equal to the set consisting of zero by showing that each one is a subset of the other so let's start with a y in b then for every positive real number r y is in zero r so for every positive real number r, y is between zero and r. So in other words, y is a non-negative real number that is less than every positive real number. So y has to be zero. I put this in red because this is a fact you might wanna prove if you haven't already. The statement is that y being equal to zero is equivalent to y being a non-negative real number that is less than every positive real number. Okay, so since y and b was arbitrary, we have shown that b is a subset of the set consisting of just zero. For the other direction, let y be in the set consisting of just zero. That means that y is equal to zero. For all positive real numbers r, zero is in the half open interval zero r. So y is in the set b. Okay, it follows that the set consisting just of zero is a subset of b. And since we have subset in both directions by the axiom of extensionality, b is equal to the set consisting of only zero. One last thing, recall that sets A and B are called disjoint if their intersection is empty, right? And here's the Venn diagram of that situation. We did this a little earlier. More generally, if X is a non-empty set of sets, we say that X is disjoint if intersection X is equal to empty. We say that X is pairwise disjoint if for all A, B, and X with A not equal to B, A and B are disjoint. As an example, let X be the set of open intervals of the form N, N plus one, where N is in Z. X is both disjoint and pairwise disjoint. Okay? And you may want to take a moment to look at this and convince yourself of that. 